Hi, it's Dr. Isim here. I'm here with the last part of Chapter 10, The Psychoanalytic Viewpoint of Personality. This is Part 4, and this is Freud's Defense Mechanisms, an explanation of what they are and how they work. One of the most important developments of Freud's writings and his works are his defense mechanisms. And these are important because they are able to explain a lot of human behavior that seems to be sort of counterintuitive. And he explains it as something that the ego does when it's being threatened by reality or the id or their superego who are irrational, both of them. And sometimes they place overly harsh demands onto the ego and the ego starts to become overwhelmed. So what happens when the ego becomes overwhelmed? Unfortunately, the experience of anxiety. Anxiety is the result of the ego not being able to satisfy the desires and impulses of both the id and the superego. So anxiety that's generated when the ego can't satisfy both the superego and the id, it's, it sucks. It doesn't feel good. It's a very unpleasant state. And so, of course, the ego wants to do something to eliminate it or at least decrease it. So these defense mechanisms are a way to temporarily shield a person from feeling that anxiety. Sometimes it's only very temporary. Sometimes people can hold on to these defense mechanisms for a long period of time. And actually that might not be such a bad thing in some cases. So they can be successful in putting off the feeling of anxiety. And there was even one defense mechanism that Freud thought was actually adaptive. It's not a bad thing at all. But for the most part, most of these defense mechanisms are good in the short term, but they're really not a positive thing to do in the long term because sometimes you have to experience anxiety. You have to experience that aversive feeling to be able to repair or get past that conflict and move towards mental health. Okay, the first one I'll talk about is repression. And repression is just simply when something is just Thinking about it and realizing it in your conscious mind is too aversive. It's either frightening, generates a huge amount of anxiety, or something that you just can't even fathom. What happens is that the ego just takes those thoughts, those feelings, and just pushes them so far down into the unconscious mind that a person is not even aware of them. So this was one way that people explained memories of being sexually abused. And those have been argued to have not been true. There have been a lot of court cases. But what happens with repression is that the memory or the experience, whatever it was, generates so much anxiety, you just push it down to the unconscious mind so you don't have to worry about it again, ever again, hopefully, is what the ego thinks. But unfortunately, there's a limit to the amount of stuff, uncomfortable stuff that generates anxiety or aversive feelings that can be repressed because the unconscious doesn't have a unlimited capacity. So when you put too much down in there, eventually what happens is it starts coming out in the form of anxiety disorders and depression. So it's something that might be effective in the short run, particularly if you don't have a lot of stuff that you're gonna shove down into the subconscious, but it's not an ideal thing to do. The next one is reaction formation. And reaction formation is when a person has thoughts or feelings that are so frightening that they can't even consider them in the conscious mind. So what happens is that the ego takes those thoughts and feelings and reverses them, flips the script, and a person starts behaving in a way that's completely opposite of how they truly feel. So this explains the story that I led with at the beginning of this whole lecture and the story about George Peach, where he was the politician who fought against sex crimes and wanted to put all of the vendors of adult bookstores and the prostitutes and the pimps all out of business because he wanted to support the victims. And unfortunately, what he was doing on the side was consorting with prostitutes and he was engaging in those illicit activities. So how could he possibly have fought publicly and stood publicly to be against all of those things, and yet here he was consorting with prostitutes? Well, this is an example of Freud's reaction formation. So he had these desires. These are the desires of the id, and these desires he wanted to have fulfilled. But to be that kind of person who would engage in those kinds of crimes was so abhorrent to the ego that what the ego did is shifted it and had them behave outwardly in a way that was completely opposite. 
Another example is this gentleman here to the left. His name is William Bennett, and I think Funder mentions him in the book. But he wrote a book, and he has done lots of speaking and lots of work on this idea that people need to have high morals and strong virtues. And it came out after he published the book. He even spoke at Fresno State, and I think we have a copy of this book somewhere in the house from that speaking tour. Shortly after that, it came out that he owed $8 million in gambling debts. So here's a man who extols all the benefits of being virtuous and having high morals. And at the same time, he is in debt because of a gambling addiction. This is another example of reaction formation. It happens when the urge that is motivating their behavior is so unacceptable and it creates so much anxiety and so much conflict that they end up behaving in a way that's completely opposite of how they truly feel. The next one is denial, and I like to say it's not just a river in Egypt. Denial happens when the thought or the feeling is so anxiety provoking that you don't repress it. It doesn't get shoved down to the unconscious where it's totally out of awareness. It just gets ignored or reappraised as it's really not that bad. So this is what's used to explain people who find out from their friends or other people that their partner is cheating on them and they think, no, that couldn't be the case. Or people who have addictions and they say, oh, you know, I can stop anytime. It's really not a problem. This is an example of denial where you just don't think about the facts as being the facts. You just kind of make them to be something that can't be true. It just it can't be true, okay? Another form of denial is instead of reappraising the facts as being not true, that you refuse to even think about that as being true, whatever it is, the feeling. Maybe someone tells you that your partner's cheating on you, or maybe someone tells you they find out that you're about to lose your job and you think that that can't be, and so you refuse to even consider the possibility. I have a personal experience with this in that my father and mother all of a sudden asked my siblings and I to meet them out to dinner, which isn't unusual, but when it's a sudden thing, it kind of made me wonder what was going on. And at some point in the dinner, my father said, you know, I just want to let you know that I went to the doctor because I had some back pain and they did some scans and they found that I have several little tumors, little lumps in my back and my upper back. And I just want to let you guys know what's going on. And so my brother and my sister, they were like, okay, fine. Thank you. But I, knowing that that's not a good thing, said, so what you're saying is that you have cancer and their faces just dropped because nobody wanted to realize that fact that my father was telling us that he had a terminal illness. It's easier just to reappraise it or even just ignore the facts when they're right in your face than to deal with the anxiety and the discomfort that realizing the truth brings you. So the next one is projection. Projection happens when you identify something in another person that you really don't like in yourself. And so as soon as you see it in somebody else, you think that it's horrible. You resent it or you have a strong reaction to it. And this is something that Brene Brown talks about too, in that if you think about people who are really judgmental, the things that they are judgmental about in other people are the very things in themselves that bring them shame. So the things that you don't like about yourself, the things that actually generate anxiety if you consider that they might be true, those are the first things you're gonna point out about other people. That's projection. The next one is rationalization. And rationalization is when you're faced with some fact or some circumstance or some feeling that generates anxiety because for some reason you know that it's probably not something that you should be doing or saying or thinking or feeling and you reappraise it so that it's not so bad. You come up with a reasonable explanation for some behavior that is not exactly socially acceptable. So in the cartoon, she says, oh, well, I can't lose weight because the fillings in my teeth, they keep drawing me to the fridge and then I eat, right? So it's not my fault. It's really the fillings. What happens with rationalization is it's the result of when a person experiences cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is having two competing thoughts in your head at the same time. They're dissonant. You can't have two competing beliefs in your head. If you believe that, for example, you need to lose weight and it's wrong for you to continue to eat, and so you have a hard time stopping yourself from eating, it's easy to come up with that rationalization and say, oh, I can't help myself because what happens is the fillings, like I was saying before, the fillings in my teeth draw me to the fridge and I'm not to blame for my weight gain. 
Or here's another one. You believe that it's not okay to cheat on an exam, but yet you end up cheating on an exam, an online exam. Those are two competing thoughts in your head or competing ideas. You come up with a rationalization. Well, the teacher must have known that I can Google any of the answers. They're all over the internet. So they must have known that was going to happen. So I'm sure that my behavior is fine because they already knew that would happen. That's an example of rationalization. Displacement is another, and this is the one that I sometimes call the kick the dog theory. And this is when you have a very strong feeling or emotion, and instead of directing it towards the appropriate person or the source, you take it out on something else. So here is a baseball player who struck out. He's feeling angry with himself, but what does he do? He destroys the bat. Like I said, it's the kick the dog theory. Here you see this little example of the father in the family. Maybe he gets in trouble at work, so he comes home and he yells at his wife, and his wife knows, well, okay, I shouldn't yell at my husband, so she turns around and yells at the kid, and the kid really has no outlet because he can't yell at his mom, so he takes it out on the stuffed animal or the dog, whichever they have closest. This is not really an effective thing for anger. It's not an effective way to discharge anger, so it's not such a good idea to do. Sublimation is the defense mechanism that Freud thought was actually pretty adaptive because what you end up doing in this case is you take that psychic energy, the psychic energy and the anxiety that is created by unacceptable thoughts or feelings, and you direct that energy into something else, something adaptive, something like art or sports or something that is productive that results in you throwing all your energy into producing something beautiful, or in this case, becoming a pro kickboxer. So this is when unacceptable desires, and they can be sexual, they can be aggressive, they can be anything from the id, those desires are channeled into socially acceptable activities. Intellectualization happens when there is a feeling or a belief or something that is so traumatizing, it's so difficult, you don't wanna deal with the anxiety that's generated by that belief. And so what the individual does is they just strip all of the emotion out of it and they focus on just the idea or the belief. So it's an overemphasis on thinking or analysis of whatever the situation is instead of the feelings and the anxiety that that situation creates. So it's when you separate any of the cognitive aspects of the situation from the emotional parts. Focus on the facts. And you can see my two examples here. These are characters that you may have watched, Sherlock Holmes and The Doctor in House. They were very good at stripping away all the emotion and sticking only to the facts or the analysis of the situation. What happened with House is that he had a horrible bedside manner because he wasn't able to convey any sort of empathy because all he focused on were the facts. This happens when people are talking about warfare. I remember during the Gulf War, there would be broadcasts where they would have updates on the war and politicians would come on and they would talk about how there were civilians that had been killed in different countries. They wouldn't focus on the killing part. They would use words like a number of casualties that were unavoidable and they would never focus on the actual emotions of the situation. They would just talk about the facts and how these things had to happen. And probably some rationalization going on here too. But really divorcing all of the emotion, all of the anxiety of what happened from just the pure facts. That's an example of intellectualization. And people do it when the reality of a situation is just so uncomfortable or horrifying or painful that you can't deal with it. You just need to stick to the facts. Let's say you have somebody who has a diagnosis of a horrible terminal illness. Instead of focusing on the actual situation where they're going to die, they have a terminal illness, they instead direct all of their energy, all of their psychic energy into identifying possible treatments and the rates of success and survival rates. And they do all of this work on identifying the facts of that disease and none of the work on the feelings that it generates. One of the things that research indicates is that this is an effective way to deal with anxiety, to reduce anxiety, to reappraise and talk about a situation without any of the emotion. Okay. Let's talk about defense mechanisms overall. Are they something that are positive? Well, they can be. They can be, especially in the short term, but if they're used in the long term, then they can actually be harmful. So when they result in things like reduced productivity or damaged relationships, then they're not something that you should continue. If you use something like denial, 
in the short term to help you deal with the anxiety until you can get to a place where you can actually process it, then it's maybe not such a bad thing. So I just want to wrap up with some reactions to Freud. Freud, as you know from your other classes, gets panned quite a bit and criticized quite a bit. And there are some very good reasons for that. Probably one of the most important ones is that it was a very sexist theory that he came up with. I think that he's probably to blame for some of that, but also the zeitgeist and the culture at the time led into those beliefs. So definitely it wasn't a culture where men and women were considered equals. Definitely men were thought to be superior. And so in his theories, he sees men or males as being the norm. And then women are some kind of a deviation from the norm. And women, according to Freud, had less self-esteem they, and they just weren't as valued and they had lower morals than males in society. Other criticisms of Freud include his theory was based on his patients. They were case studies. And so they weren't something that you can generalize to other people. But probably the criticism that is most often heard is that his theories are not testable. So it's very difficult to do any sort of empirical studies on his tests. But I will say that there is one study in particular that does lend some credence to his idea of reaction formation. And that was a study that examined people who are homophobic, who report having extreme reactions to people that report being homosexual. What they did, and this was based on, like I said, the idea of reaction formation, they identified a group of men who had strong homophobic tendencies or feelings, and a group of men who were not homophobic, who had more positive feelings towards people who were homosexual. And they showed them porn, actually gay porn, not at the same time, they had separate groups, and they measured their blood flow using a plethysmograph on the penis. So the idea, according to Freud, is that if reaction formation is the cause of people's homophobic reactions, then the males who were homophobic should show more of a sexual response to gay porn than the males who are not homophobic. Because reaction formation is when what you really feel and what you believe is so horrifying that you flip the script and you behave in a way that is opposite of what you truly feel. And if you felt like you had some sexual attraction to males as a male, then your reaction formation to that would be to hate anybody who is attracted to males who is also a male themselves. So interestingly, what they did find is that indeed men who were homophobic showed stronger sexual response as measured by this plethysmograph. It's a little band that goes around the penis and it measures blood flow. They found more sexual arousal for the homophobic men to the gay porn than the non-homophobic men to the gay porn. So that's a study that does show or does lend a little bit of evidence to support at least one of his defense mechanisms, and that is the reaction formation defense mechanism. Another criticism that's been leveled at Freud is that He developed all his psychoanalytic theories, his view of the internal structures of the mind and so on, on his case studies. It wasn't something that he tested himself and it wasn't something that he used large studies and groups of people to come up with his theories. He based them on individuals and individuals that were in particular his clients. So that is definitely a criticism that can be leveraged towards Freud. That is the end of that chapter. And I will close and I'll see you in the next lecture.